Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to the New York Institute for the Humanities podcast, now at the New York Public Library. I'm Robert Boynton. In this episode from The Vault, we hear from Mae Berenbaum about why insects scare us. Mae Berenbaum is an American entomologist whose research focuses on the chemical interactions between herbivorous insects and their host plants. She teaches entomology at the University of Illinois and was awarded the National Medal of Science in 2014. She is also the organizer of the annual Insect Fear Film Festival. Most reliably, the way to unsettle or alarm or or terrify people is the prospect of being invaded by creatures of our very own planet. Those are insects and their relatives in the phylum Arthropoda, particularly from the 50s, many examples of insect invasions is the focus of science fiction films, sometimes blown up to giant proportions as they are in them by atomic testing, or in the case of Monster from Green Hell, cosmic radiation and a US military experiment gone awry. Sometimes their origins are a little more um, or less believable, as in the giant spider invasion. These are spiders that come from a black hole and end up landing in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. And then giant insects that make no sense whatsoever, as the case of Mothra, who was an egg on Monster Island, awakened by atomic testing, turning into a caterpillar who swims to... Tokyo in order to commune telepathically with tiny little women who were portrayed by two sisters in a singing group called the Peanuts. Very strange. And there's a reason that insects make such convenient invaders. They are the one group of uh, antagonists in movies that it's still politically correct to hate. And the reason for that is they are about as different from humans as any creature can be and still be of this planet. Very little in an insect face to relate to. They don't blink or smile. There are very few morphological features in common. So they make convenient enemies and objects of fear in all kinds of science fiction scenarios. The reason they're so different, even though they cohabit with us on planet Earth, is that they really occupy a different part of the planet that we do. Living organisms on the planet uh, span a range of sizes of about 13 orders of magnitude, from the largest, like blue whales, whose tongues are a third of a mile long, to tiny little creatures like the rotifer, tardigrades there, uh, they're called water bears, little creatures that live in the interstitial spaces filled with water between grains of sand. Insects occupy only a small part of that 13 orders of magnitude, four orders of magnitude, the very largest insects being about the size of a small rodent, like the goliath beetles from uh, Africa, to the very smallest, which are tiny little wasps that are are parasitic. They're called parasitoids. They lay their eggs inside the bodies and sometimes the eggs of other insects. And there are parasitoid wasps in the family Mimarity. They're called fairy flies that are actually smaller than a single-celled amoeba. So an entire wasp with four wings, six legs, and the like is actually smaller than a single-celled protozoan. So life in the small end of things imposes a different set of physical constraints on organisms, and their uh, morphology, physiology, and behavior reflect the fact that they're small. We, as organisms go, are much larger and, and face a whole different set of physical constraints. One of the most obvious differences between insects and their other relatives in the, in the phylum arthropoda, the jointed-legged animals, is that uh, their skeletons are on the outside rather than the inside. They have exoskeletons, and there are many reasons that an exoskeleton is more efficient if you're small. But the end result of having an exoskeleton explains some of the most striking differences between us vertebrates and those arthropods. One real constraint of having an external skeleton is it doesn't grow with you. It doesn't stretch to accommodate an increase in size. So as a consequence, insects and other arthropods are obligated to molt, to shed their skins periodically to get bigger. And that molting, or ecdysis as it's called, provides them with an opportunity that organisms with an internal skeleton don't necessarily have, and that's to reinvent themselves at every molt. Metamorphosis has been a major explanation for the tremendous success of insects. Different life stages can specialize for different functions. So the most common form of metamorphosis, about 90% of all the uh, million or so species of insects on the planet, is the familiar egg to larva to pupa to adult 
adult, like butterf egg to butter to caterpillar to pupa or chrysalis to adult. But there are other insects that, with that so-called complete metamorphosis that do a lot more with it, like the uh, Moloid or blister beetles, that basically every life stage is morphologically, uh, anatomically different and has different biology. So ultimately, they are really insects then, because of metamorphosis, are the ultimate transformers in real life. So it's not at all inappropriate that in the most recent Transformers 1 and 2 movies that one of the featured transformers is Bumblebee, insect it's inspired. All he does is change into a car, which is, I mean, blister beetles do much better than that. Being small also gives insects access to environments that we can't even begin to imagine that really themselves seem quite like science fiction scenarios. And you probably remember from the movie Alien, here's John Hurt, who is horrified to discover that there's been an alien living inside him who, to complete its development, must burst forth through its chest. Well, that is exactly the lifestyle of the parasitic wasps, the parasitoid wasps, who inject their eggs inside their hosts, not John Hurt and other actors, but uh, scale insects and aphids in this case. The larvae develop internally, and when metamorphosis is complete, they burst out of their hosts, which Facial features aren't quite as dramatic here. <laughs> Another thing that external skeleton has allowed insects to do is something that no other real organism on the planet uh, has been able to do, and that's to develop wings without giving up a set of appendages. We have other flying organisms on the planet, but none of them, other than those that uh, have been imagined, like Pegasus and angels, actually have wings that aren't made of appendages. So bats gave up their arms, as did birds. So insects, though, have not just two legs, but four legs and six legs. They don't give up any of them, and one or two pairs of wings, and which gives them the ability to fly, which until relatively re recently in the history of humanity or the human species has escaped our capacity. It's one of the reasons that uh, the sky is such a source of anxiety in so many of these, of these films. Or the, uh, there's a book about the history of 1950s science fiction. It was called Keep Watching the Skies, sort of a, a byword of movies of this time, because that's where danger comes from, as in the deadly mantis. Here you see the mantis flying. So flying, again, something that is alien to us as a species, and yet there are a million insects that, more or less, that are capable of, of flying. Being encased in a suit, in an essentially a suit of armor, an exoskeleton, means that their sensory systems are different as well. They have sensory organs that project out into the environment. As you heard, we breathe through, our, our receptors are all internal. Their receptors are out there on uh, organs that look more like household appliances than they do body parts. Another disconcerting aspect. And their small size, because of the surface area volume ratio, uh, which is a whole lecture in and of itself, gives them abilities that to us appear almost like supernatural powers, their super strength. Uh, tip, this is a bumblebee trained to drag two car loaded cars equal to 300 times its own weight. It's mind-boggling in human terms. It not, isn't really, if a human was the size of a bumblebee, he or she could probably pull two loaded cars equal to 300 times his or her weight as well because of the surface area volume ratio. Muscle strength is proportional to cross-sectional area. And so when you're very, very small, the cross-sectional area is moving less volume. So you look really strong, but it's only because you're small. But nonetheless, it's pretty impressive. As are these other abilities that appear to us to be almost otherworldly, silkworms spin textiles out of their saliva. And of course, Spider-Man is a figment of someone's imagination, yet silkworms are real. There are receptors on the radar-like antennae of, of the giant Saturnian moths that can detect the presence of as few as 100 molecules. There are insects that can light up their abdomens, and insects that can see into the ultraviolet region, which we can't do, sort of supervision. And there are even insects that can, like these water striders, can literally walk on the surface of the water, uh, which is why in England, and they're called Jesus bugs. It's all uh, just a reflection of the fact that they're small, but from our perspective, they're clearly not like us. And so what's really surprising, though, is that uh, screenwriters who have tried to imagine the most inconceivable things often can't even begin to imagine what insects really are capable of. 
So uh, just some examples of what is unsettling in, in the movies that is a quotidian activity for insects. Drinking human blood, for example, particularly gruesome and quite fascinating. There's a history of, of at least eight decades of vampire films from Nosferatu in 1922 to The Vampire's Assistant in 2009. It's regarded as uh, somewhat gruesome, but again, it's the uh, meal of the day for thousands of insects and other arthropods, including ticks. In fact, there are insects that will go to enormous lengths to get to human blood, even when it's not in a human. For example, bed bugs, Cymex lectularius, are enjoying a resurgence of abundance in New York and, and other major metropolitan areas. They are ectoparasites of humans, so only known hosts are humans, and they like to hide in mattresses and other cracks and crevices in people's houses and come out at night to feed. When they go back to their cracks and crevices uh, with their crops full of human blood, then they have to watch out for this insect, which is, insect, which is Redvius personatus. It's called the masked bedbug hunter. It's in a family, the Redvius, they're known as the assassin bugs. That's their common name, and this particular species seeks out bed bugs, has a pier set of piercing sucking mouth parts, uses them to plunge them into the body of the bed bug and suck up the human blood that way. So it's as if they're, you know, and these guys are doing the shopping and they're being mugged by the uh, uh, masked bed bug hunters. Now, if you note the appearance of the mass, why is it called the masked bed bug hunter? The nymphs, or the immature stages of the mass bedbug hunter, are sticky. These external su surface is sticky. And as they climb around underneath beds and such in search of bedbugs, they actually accumulate lint. So they are literally killer dust bunnies, <laughs> at least from the perspective of bedbugs. So uh, not a concept that has, been, that has appeared on film yet, to my knowledge. So they're covered, they're covering themselves to uh, blend in to avoid detection. Not unlike how the character Dutch, played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, in the film Predator, escapes detection by the alien predator by covering his body uh, with mud. So he uses mud as camouflage, which allows him to approach the alien and eventually to destroy it. Well, mud is not readily available to many insects. If you're a caterpillar, for example, on the top of a tree on a leaf, you can't really go run down to the ground to gather up mud. You don't have any hands to dig it up with in any case. So many insects have to resort to their own self-made material to cover up their body signature, be it heat or others, otherwise. And here's where we get to the four-letter Anglo-Saxon term for excrement. And actually, entomologists prefer the five-letter German term uh, frass. Frass is from the German fressen, which means to devour, was used in, apparently, first coined by a lepidopterist, a person who studies butterflies and caterpillars, H.F. Stainton suggested the word, the German word, frass, to, explain, to, to be used as synonymous with insect excrement. Frass uh, in German in, in has more or less the uh, connotations of uh, swill, animal food that animals eat. Uh, we may, without impropriety, use the same word for the purpose of expressing the immediate effect of, lar of a caterpillar's jaws. And the more indirect effect of the, and this is a word you don't see very often, excrementitious matter ejected by the larva. <laughs> Rejectamenta actually was proposed as well, but never really caught on. But excrementitious, you can actually find on the list of words for the uh, script spelling bee. So it still does appear. So what do I mean by this? Well, if you can't cover yourself with mud, what's frass for, after all? Many, many species resort to covering themselves with their own excrement to avoid detection, possibly to repel otherwise potentially interested predators. This is the three-lined potato beetle, Lima trilineata, is a leaf beetle larva. But the most spectacular, and these are photos from Tom Eisner, who has an uncanny ability to find and photograph the most remarkable insects. These are called tortoise beetles because in their adult stage, they look like little turtles. In their larval stages, though, they're sometimes called trash peddlers because they have a long projection at the end of their abdomen called the anal fork. And the anal fork, as unappetizing as it might sound, is actually used to gather the um, cast skins and the frass of the larva as it grows. Talk about anal retentive. They never get rid of it. They <laughs> carry it around with them at all times. And in fact, when danger threatens, they wave it at potential predators. 
So uh, I think that does Arnold Schwarzenegger one better. Just uh, an example here of tortoise beetles sort of waving their frass at potential enemies. And this is a tortoise beetle that has uh, greatly elaborated. This is all frass, sort of artistically arranged to be a, a complex, challenging puzzle for any would-be predator. So much more artful and effective than mud. Now, not all of all insects simply cover themselves with frass. One is another remarkable story from Martha Weiss, who calls herself a fecologist. She studies the uh, ecology of waste voiding, yeah, of frass, basically, of the skipper caterpillar. And as you can see, it can, as I'm quoting here, shoot poop great distances. This is scientifically called ballistic ejection. It's very effective at repelling predators. Uh, as she found, one particular skipper caterpillar made a phenomenal 153 centimeter expulsion of the equivalent of a 76 yard field goal in football, which beats the national football record by 13 yards. Now, in science fiction or horror films, it's not just mud that's used to conceal an identity. Sometimes things get a little gruesome, as in uh, Psycho, for example, where Anthony Perkins' character dresses in his mother's clothes, but even more unsettling, and the subject of, of many, many films based on the true story of uh, Ed Gein, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, describes Leatherface, who takes the skin of his victims and co covers himself with the actual skin of his dead victims. Very scary, very unsettling. But again, business as usual for many insects. Another example here of the same idea of using the skin of your victims, the corpses, as a way of concealing your identity. That was a, the concept in Men in Black where Edgar, the cockroach-like alien, kills a person and then inhabits his body, much to the chagrin of the man's wife or widow. And this gets him through the whole film until he reveals his true identity as a cockroach when Will Smith's character stomps on a terrestrial cockroach, which incenses him and he appears as his true self. So clothing yourself in the corpse of your victims, or your, the clothing of your victim. Business as usual, again, another story from Tom Eisner. This is a lacewing larva, Chrysopus losani. Lacewings are predators, and this lacewing has unusual sort of grappling hooks on its back, and what it's doing here is plucking the waxy filamentous protective covering on its prey of choice. These are woolly alder aphids, they're called. And they make this, uh, if you ever had uh, cottony cushion scale on your coleus houseplants, same general idea. They produce this fluffy, waxy material to, protect, to hide. These guys steal the, uh, or pluck the, the wool and put it on their own back. So ultimately, they look like woolly alder aphids. Why would they dress up? not Halloween, because woolly alder aphids, like most aphids, produce a sugary secretion, it's also a form of frass, called honeydew. Aphids, they suck plant sap, which is very rich in sugars, but very low in protein, so they have to process huge quantities of it to get the protein they need, and most of it, of the excess sugars, get shot out the other end, which is irresistibly attractive to ants, no accounting for taste, and these ants then, with their stings and their social behavior, are pugnacious bodyguards for these woolly alder aphids. So a lacewing clad in woolly alder aphid wool can go right past an ant and feast on woolly alder aphids. And when you scrape off the wool, then the ants find the, the lacewing and unceremoniously dump them off the edge of the uh, tree or else kill them. A somewhat more grotesque example of using corpses is the ant catching assassin bug, another member of the family Regiviti, that feeds on ants, uses its piercing sucking mouth parts to suck out all the hemolymph for blood, and then takes the corpses of its dinner and attaches them to its back and walks around with piles of dead ants on its back. It has uh, adhesive threads that basically uh, anchor them. So why why would anyone do such a thing? Because the uh, ant-catching assassin bugs have their own enemies who apparently can't see through the pile of dead ant bodies to track them down and find them. So that's, uh, in some ways, not that 
gruesome. They're using these dead bodies to camouflage themselves from their own enemies. But there are other examples of more insidious use of dead bodies or victims along the lines of uh, the 1957 film Attack of the Crab Monster, where crab monsters eat people, absorb their consciousness, and then use the voices of the prey to lure others to their death. Well, that's not unlike what the termite-eating assassin bug does. This is uh, Salivata variegata. It is an African assassin bug that preys on termites, also social insects. The social insects tend to be victims, just like we're social and we're bound by social conventions. A lot of the social species have uh, genetically programmed behaviors that are difficult to alter um, sort of automated program responses. Termites, for example, like to bury their dead. There's even termites whose job in the colonies to seek out dead bodies and take them out of the colony so they don't rot and ruin the ambiance. And uh, termite-eating assassin bugs have taken advantage of this in that one assassin bug will come up to the periphery of a termite colony, grab a termite worker, and uh, take it away, suck it dry, and then take the, the corpse and go to the, uh, perif back to the periphery and wave it in the presence of patrolling workers who, when they see a corpse, can't help themselves and will seek out that corpse. And the assassin bug actually backs away waving as bait, waving the dead termite until eventually the worker is so far away from the rest of the colony that it can't be helped. And then the termite eating assassin bug drops the dead body and acquires a new one. There are probably chemical cues. In ants, for example, corpse carrying behavior is mediated by specific, I think it's one, two diolian, specific chemicals that emanate from dead insects. Uh, a lot of the vulnerability of social insects is due to the fact that they have these programmed responses to chemical cues. So they're, as you'll see, nests get invaded by things that don't even look a bit like an ant or a termite or any other social insect yet the uh, workers happily adopt it as if one of their own. So it's a real Achilles heel or six heels, I guess, for um, the social insects. Another example of a more aggressive use of um, luring prey, uh, another science fiction film set in New York. I'd hope to use all New York examples. New York has been destroyed a, a lot of times in the movies, so, but uh, not enough by insects. So. Uh, Mimic, for example, is the story of of a genetic engineering experiment gone awry, conducted at the American Museum of Natural History. Dr. Susan Tyler, played by uh, Mira Sorvino, by genetic engineering manages to construct the Judas breed, which is a modified cockroach mantis termite, which is thought to have been self -pro programmed to self-destruct. It escapes, it lives in the subway system of New York, evolves extremely rapidly to become as large as humans and then capable of mimicking the behavior of humans. So they lurk in the subway tunnels and lure humans to their death. So next time you complain if a train is late, I mean, think of what could be waiting for you down there in the tunnels. So. Evolving to look like your prey happens all the time in the insect world or the arthropod world. All of these ant-looking creatures are actually not ants at all, they're spiders. They're spiders that prey on ants. And the way they get into these colonies is by pushing all the right buttons on the ant worker that the ant workers use to respond to. So the, the genus is Merm arachne, which literally means ant spider. And different species resemble different spiders. There you can see they're really good mimics, and uh, they actually even, just like the Judas breed, imitate the behavior of ants. We are looking there as the butt end of a spider that looks like the front end of a weaver ant or a Karenga ant. And in fact, you know how ants, when they meet each other, they raise their heads and antenate each other? Well, the spider mimics this behavior by raising its butt, and uh, the ants can't tell the difference. And a lot of social insects it's not morphology, it's chemistry. And in, in this particular example, these don't seem to be bothered by the chemistry, although there are many, they're called inquilines, uninvited guests. And Well, some of the inquilines are incredible. There are staphylinid beetles that move into social insect colonies and within a matter of an hour or two, acquire the nest odor. They have these, uh, well, you remember he was talking about lipophilic materials there that absorb volatile substances very quickly. And uh, that's the key to their survival. If you can survive the first hour, then you get adopted. In this case, it's kind of a combination of appearance, behavior, and possibly chemistry. Imitating things 
pretending to be something you're not, very Halloween-y. The ultimate of this here then is uh, in Terminator 2 Judgment Day. This is where an advanced robot prototype, the T-1000, made of a, what's called a mimetic polyalloy in the film, can actually assume the shape and appearance of anything it touches, including humans. And if you remember the movie, it assumes the shape and appearance and voice of a police officer and then goes out to find John Connor. So future John Connor sends a sort of refurbished Terminator back to the past to save the present day John Connor. But this uncanny ability, this mimetic polyalloy, allows T-1000 to assume any appearance, to take on any shape, including a checkerboard tile floor. Again, not something that arthropods can't do. Crypsis background matching is incredibly common, not only among predators, but also among prey species. Can you see the, the moth there? But like T1000, there are even background matching species that can change colors to match their background. This is a geometric caterpillar. It's an in, in the inchworm family. You know, inchworms look like, a lot of them look like twigs, which is fine if you're eating twigs. This particular species eats twigs and oat catkins, which are the flowers. There is a chemical in the flowers that if the caterpillar ingests them, it will develop to assume the shape of oak flowers. So depending on what it's eating, its body shape reflects exactly what it's eating. Okay, T-1000 can do it by touch. These guys have to eat. But the crab spider, Mizumunovadia, doesn't need to eat. All it needs to do is sense reflected light, and it can change its color to match its background. On a whitish purple flower, it's white. Uh, the same species of spider, the same individual, on a yellow flower can turn yellow. That's it, though. It, can, it better not land on a red flower, because all it can do is uh, yellow and to white and back again. But it's still enough to avoid detection by pollinators that visit these flowers. And in fact, it even exploits certain behavioral attributes of pollinators, like honeybees. Honeybees can see into the ultraviolet, one of their superpowers. They can see wavelengths of light that we can't see. And in fact, flowers take advantage of, of this fact by signaling to their appropriate pollinators with UV-absorbing pigment, pigments where the nectar is stored. Flowers don't like to give away their nectar to visitors who do not carry pollen away. So if you can see into the ultraviolet, you can see exactly where the nectar is. So they're used to these contrasting UV patterns. Well, it turns out Mizuminovadia is yellow in visible light, but it's actually UV absorbing in the UV range and uh, aligns itself so that it is sitting exactly on the position in the flower where the bee is most attracted. A lot of insects then uh, match their background or assume certain colors and shapes to av avoid detection. That's one way is to escape notice, but maybe a more effective dis defense is simply being repulsive and disgusting to any potential predator. So filmmakers have tapped into these deeply, deep-seated, inborn disgusts and revulsion that we humans have, such as uh, coprophobia, which is uh, fear of excrement, <laughs> fress. In the little-known <laughs> direct-to-video film <laughs> called Monsterd, Jack Schmidt is an escaped serial killer gunned down by police in a sewer. He falls into, as usual, a puddle of chemical waste and is transformed into a half-human, half-feces monster who goes on a killing spree. Totally disgusting and repulsive. Lots of insects actually look like excrement. And it appears to be a very widespread and effective way to repel your, your potential enemies. Most of them look like bird droppings because most of the consumers of other caterpillars and other soft-bodied species and foliage are birds. And it's widespread, not just caterpillars. A whole, at least two families of caterpillars have bird dropping mimics. And a number of adult stage moths also look just like bird droppings. And it's more than just an appearance in the swallowtails, species, species in the genus Papilio. The early stages all look like bird droppings, including that little white saddle in the middle, which looks like on a bird dropping, you always see this white area. That's uric acid. It's a waste product. And caterpillars in the genus Papilio don't actually void their uric acid. They make it as a waste product, but they retain it. Again, anal retentiveness proves to be very adaptive because they incorporate it into that little white band, which looks and potentially tastes and smells just like a bird dropping because it's made of the same material. 
So fake bird poo is, uh, goes beyond the Lepidoptera. Um, there's a bird dropping spider there. And, but what is a tiny, tiny, and there's a limit. The, the biggest bird dropping mimic is the giant swallowtail. It's about three inches long. And they can't get much bigger than that because there are no birds in North America that uh, produce bird droppings more than three inches. <laughs> well, what do you do on the other end if you're tiny? You can't really be a convincing bird dropping. Well, in the case of these chrysomelid beetles called eczema uh, gibosa, uh, little tiny, tiny beetles that actually look like caterpillar droppings. So they assume the morphology appropriate to their size. OK, what are other deep-seated fears that uh, filmmakers tap into? Ophidiophobia, fear of snakes. Well, that's the uh, basis for the film. <laughs> actually, I had trouble searching for this. I didn't know how many S's there were. This is a mad scientist who, for reasons that aren't really clear in the film, turns people into snakes. Once this motion picture sinks its fangs into you, you'll never be the same. A lot of people are afraid of snakes. Well, a lot of potential enemies of insects are afraid of snakes as well. And many, particularly caterpillars, are really, really good snake mimics. For example, this is a spice with swallowtail, another member of the genus Papilio. Those are not eyes, those are fake eyes. But they are positioned in such a way to make it look like it is a green tree snake. OK, you ask, these caterpillars are two inches long. What kind of bird is stupid enough to think that something two inches long is a great tree snake? Turns out many insectivorous birds have very poor depth perception. They have eyes on the side of their head. So this could either be a two inch snake really close or a two foot snake fairly far away. And if it's scary enough snake, no bird is going to hang around and find out whether it needs um, some sort of vision correction before it flies away. So that's why there's so many snake mimics. Another fear that filmmakers have exploited that arthropods have as well, arachnophobia. Of course, a film by that name, but even before that, 1953, one of the very first of the giant arthropod films, Mesa of Lost Women, very strange movie about uh, Dr. Aranya, played by Jackie Coogan, in the El Muerto Desert, the desert of death, who for reasons also not made clear in the film, likes to transfuse spider hormones into women and women hormones into spiders to generate one very, very large, vicious spider and a whole bunch of women in diaphanous gowns, long fingernails that dance the tarantella. Many giant spider movies that tap into this deep-seated fear. And there are insects that mimic spiders to repel their enemies. This uh, here is a jumping spider. And here, on the same sorts of leaves you find jumping spiders, is a really effective spider mimic. This is actually a tefritted fruit fly, not the kind you find in, in wine bottles, but uh, the true fruit flies. And you see it has the leg pattern of the spider on its wings and the general spotting pattern on its back. And it does the same kind of movements it flicks its wings just as the jumping spider does as it hunts. OK, another very deep-seated fear, nidophobia, fear of insect stings, or if you'd rather, apophobia, fear of bees, sometimes melissophobia, that's from the Greek rather than the Latin. Long-standing tradition. Killer bee movies, terror out of the skies, the bees are back, this time they're really mad. Lots of people are afraid of bees. About 40 people a year actually die from hymenoptera venom, mostly bees. There are good reasons in some contexts to be afraid of bees, which is why so many Perfectly harmless insects look like bees or other stinging hymenopterans, such as wasps. Hard to tell, but this is a bumblebee. That is a bee mimic. It's a fly, a harmless fly in the family Surfidae. Another fly that looks eerily like a honeybee. The mimicry is astonishing. In fact, these surfid flies, the hoverflies, have to compensate for some morphological shortcomings if they want to look like a bee. They're in a group of flies called the Brachycera that have stubby short little antennae. Well, any predator worth its salt knows that wasps have long antennae. So what do you do? Well, these flies have black forelegs that they dangle in the front of their heads to resemble the long black antennae of their models. And it's very effect effective. They even buzz at the same frequencies, in many cases, of their, uh, the models. And um, how about ophthalmophobia, fear of being stared at? A lot of us, you mentioned that uh, you don't look at people on the subway. You know, watch out for those mimics, though. The evil eye, very deep-seated. Uh, and the, or the explanation for why these movies are so unsettling. The beast with a million eyes, the crawling eyes, the nightmare terror of the slithering eye that unleashed agonizing horror on a screaming world. Fear of 
being stared at uh, is an effective way to repel your predators. And again, eye spots appear all over uh, insect, class insecta. Usually they're concealed, but when they're suddenly flashed, they can be, again, very unsettling to a bird who doesn't want to hang around to find out if it really is, for example, the underside of a morpho butterfly or the hostile glare of a carnivorous raptor or owl many species stare at you. These eye spots are uh, widespread. But one more uh, mimetic resemblance that's a little more difficult to explain over the years. About 50 years ago, H.E. Hinton was an entomologist who described a group of butterflies in the family um, Lycenidae whose pupae, the, that immobile metamorphic stage, were thought to resemble the face of a primate. Hinton was bothered by this received wisdom because he pointed out that this is a new world phenomenon, these sort of ape mimic pupae, yet everyone who was familiar with them thought they resembled old world apes. Now that doesn't make sense, except Hinton pointed out there is one primate that made its way to the new world that is perhaps the scariest predator of them all, and that's humans. So he actually suggested that these pupae are really resembling humans, which scares almost anything out there. Who knows if he's right, but there are some otherwise inexplicable patterns out there, like that of species of the, in the genus Acherontia, the so-called death's head moths that uh, you might know from Silence of the Lambs, have this incredible pattern of scales on their back that looks disconcertingly like a human skull. Entomologists have suggested that no, it doesn't really look like a skull. It's supposed to look like the head of a queen bee because these hawk moths, actually, they have a strongly reinforced proboscis, you know, that straw-like sucking tube. Instead of sucking nectar like self-respecting moths should do, they actually break into honeybee hives and use their strongly reinforced proboscis to break into the wax cells where the honey is stored. So they're pests of honeybee colonies. And it's thought that, at least uh, some entomologists have suggested, that this marking makes them look like a honeybee queen. I'm sorry, I will leave this up to you what they look more like. And I, to me, for reasons I can't understand, um, they look a lot like a human skull. And every European language calls these, the common name translates literally to mean death's head moth. So there's a lot to be afraid of in a human face. Even people can be afraid of human faces, particularly when features are exaggerated, as they are in coulrophobia, which is fear of clowns. Perhaps the uh, reason for the success of the movie Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Even a smiling face can be unsettling. And maybe that's be the explanation behind Theridion grallator, which is one of the strangest spiders that lives in Hawaii, and it's called the happy face spider. One species actually is highly variable throughout the Hawaiian archipelago, but all of the variations are some form or other of demonically smiling human face. Biologists have argued that that's just a coincidence, a happenstance, a fortuitous resemblance, that really these patterns are, are defensive in nature and it's hard for a predator to learn a search image if they're so variable. But I will leave you on Halloween night with perhaps another explanation. Just remember that we can be scary too. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by the New York Institute for the Humanities. You can find us on Stitcher, iTunes, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. For more information, visit us at nyihumanities.org.